We good? Yeah. Um, if y'all don't mind, uh, I don't think Jeff Herkamp's here, but uh, he doesn't know that we're actually playing Who Wore It Best, Bowl Cut Edition. Um, so that's sixth grade me. You also can't see the shorts, but they do go past my knees. So, hi everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is James Bowersby. I'm so excited to get the chance to talk today. This has been a dream of mine since I went to my first discovery as a sixth grader. One thing about me is I've grown up my entire life around sports. In the fall, I will spend my Saturdays watching football. Roll Tide, by the way. Yeah. And then the winter, I'll have Alabama basketball on the nearest screen. Nothing comes close to baseball, though. I grew up being dragged out in the heat and cold to go watch my brother play. Thank you, Will. Uh, <laughs> that's my mom. And I immediately fell in love with it. If you've been around sports for any period of time, though, you've probably heard of a dream team. For me, I have my baseball dream team. I'm not going to go through it, but girls, I'm sorry to say, Dansby is not on there. And for mom, Kevin Kiermaier is not either. <laughs> but if you need someone else on your dream team for good looks, go talk to my mom about Kevin Kiermaier. But this morning, I get the opportunity to talk to you all about making sure you are choosing the right team. If you've been around this faith thing long enough, you know it can get really hard. Things will happen that knock you down and make you feel farther away from God ever, than ever have before. Getting yourself out of these holes can be almost impossible alone, and it can completely drain you. The good news is we are given the unique opportunity to choose our team. Our team is the people who help dig us out of these holes, but it's very easy to surround yourself with people who just want to dig you deeper. Now, when I say team, I don't necessarily mean the people we see and interact with every day. I mean the people we allow to influence who we become. We can't always choose who is around us. A lot of your peer probably have that one friend that you know is a bad influence, but you just can't get away from them. Maybe they sit behind you in class, or I'll play the same sport. It is up to us to keep these people from influencing who we are as a person. These people don't just include friends. It includes anyone around us who influences who we are. The problem is finding the right people can be very hard. The people who you think are your best friend might be the reason your relationship with God is at a standstill. This is something that really got to me last year. Throughout my years of playing baseball, coach have always had a massive impact on who I am today. Last year was no different, but not in a good way. I'm a coach's pet. Everyone knows the guy that goes around and does whatever the coach says, and I'm not ashamed of that. If you're here with Taylor, you know, you should probably try it. It works out. One coach was harder to get to than the others, though. Throughout last year, I was doing whatever I could to try and gain his approval. I was spending all my time thinking about how I could play better, so he looked at me as one of his star players. After bad performances, I would spend all night thinking about what I did wrong and what I could do to make my coach happy. Worse was that while I was searching for validation from my coach, I was doing nothing to strengthen my relationship with the Lord. There was one game in particular that absolutely destroyed me. This game could make or break our playoff chances, and I blew it for my team. I thought my coach would never forgive me. The same guy who didn't shed a tear during a dog's purpose was now bawling in his room and contemplating quitting the sport he loved his entire life. I was over it. I was tired of spending my nights crying, all because I couldn't make one person in my life happy. So, I did what any guy would do after spending the night crying. I did some push-ups to feel like a man again. But then, I did something I hadn't done in a long time, and I prayed. I felt like I was going to be able to get back into my faith again and all would be well. But that was only the first part of God's plan. He wanted to show me that the coach wasn't just the problem, but some of my friends were too. I really wanted to be liked by my friends. I was doing things that I normally would have said no to in a heartbeat, but because friends thought it would be cool, I had to join in, so they thought I was cool. Then one night, God showed me the second part of his plans. I was at the beach with some friends, and I made a really stupid decision. Me and my friends kind of laughed it off, but deep down I knew it was wrong. After they went to sleep, I stayed up crying, which seems to be a common theme here. I was leaving voicemails and sending texts to people telling them how much I screwed up. I don't know what happened to me. Some of those people are in this room. I like to apologize that y'all had to wake up to that. My parents also got a call at three in the morning of me freaking out and who knows what they were thinking. Um, I don't know if anyone else's parents, but my parents have a thing where if I call them after nine, they think something bad's happened. So three in the morning must have been terrifying for them. But during all of this, I realized that letting my friends influence every, I was letting my friends influence everything about me, and it was pushing me farther away from Christ. I just wanted to fit in with the cool kids, but now I was in a deeper hole than I ever have been before. 
Now, I'm not just telling you these stories to add some sappy things to my talk and really touch y'all's hearts. I tell you them to show that putting the wrong people on your dream team can be absolutely draining. Luckily, the Bible gives us some guidelines on what your teammates should look like. In Galatians 1, 6 through 10, it reads, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a different gospel, contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For I am now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. We're so quick to drop everything, including our faith, to be like someone that we think is better than us. The thing is, these friendships are a one-way street. We put all this effort into being like them and getting them to like us, while they sit at the end of the road telling us what we have to do to reach their level. And when, they and when you fall, they don't care to help take time out of their day to help pick you back up. It can be really hard to see the problem with these people, though. They might never tell you to drop your faith and that it's weird, but they're teaching you a different gospel. They're teaching you that it is okay to sin every once in a while and that no one will find out. But while they're teaching you this, they're also teaching you that it's okay to put more effort into your friendships than your relationship with Christ. The good news is the Bible also tells us what a good friend looks like, and it's way more simple than you might think. In Proverbs 17, 17, it reads, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. The Bible tells us all the time that God loves us no matter what, so why should we expect anything different from the people on our team? The best part about these relationships is that we're now on a two-way road, a road where you all work together to stay grounded, see what I did there, and your faith. These friends love you for who you are. You don't have to spend all this energy trying to be someone you aren't. Not only that, but you can trust these people to get you out of tough situations. Proverbs says a brother is born for adversity. Your group should always be there for each other. Y'all should be able to trust each other enough to talk to each other no matter what and be there when one of you is lower than y'all have been before. This weekend is probably the best place to start to stop, whew, to start thinking about your friendships. You might be separated from your friends during small group or you might be rooming with a bunch of people you've never seen in your life. But I want you to take advantage of that. You might feel like you can be yourself more when you're around these new people. I'm not saying that you have to completely drop your old friends, though. They might be the ones needing someone to love them no matter what and for you to be there for them. But don't let them influence how you're going to live your life with Christ if they're just going to continue to push you farther and farther away. I understand it can be scary, but I encourage you to find a group that accepts you. If you don't know where to look, I want you to know that we would love to have you more at RSM. Whether this is your first time here or you haven't been here as much as you would like to, I've been here for five years now, and everyone here would definitely be on my dream team. And they would love to be on yours, too. Let me pray.